I'm Rob. And I'm Nate. And welcome back to Rob and Nate Record a Podcast. This is the beginning of a series. series. I just was going to say we're going to, going to be discussing the show Under the Banner of Heaven. Yes. So it'll be released as a, as a series of episodes. But yeah. Okay. All right. So I wrote an introduction for this. So making some waves, and I want to position this in time because this, is, this show is airing currently. So we are recording a Memorial Day weekend. 2022 and so making some waves in certain circles recently is the new fx hulu limited series under the banner of heaven based on the 2003 non-fiction book of the same name by john krakauer of into the wild and into thin air fame under the banner of heaven used the story of a religiously motivated double murder in 1984 utah as a jumping off point for a larger discussion of religious excess with mormonism as its case study the new miniseries was adapted by oscar-winning screenwriter dustin lance black milk himself a former Mormon. Black inserts into the story a fictional LDS detective played by Andrew Garfield as an audience surrogate figure. Like the book before it, the series has not been well received by many in the broader Mormon community, which comprises a large number of churches that trace their origins back to the teachings of Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. The Salt Lake City-based Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is by far the largest of these denominations. Our intent is to discuss the series as both entertainment and to examine some of the historical, social, and religious issues on which it touches. But before we do that, I wanted to talk briefly about the book, which both you and I have audio booked, uh, you much more recently uh, than I. Yeah, I'm big on, uh, where possible, I like to consume a book prior to watching the movie or series that is, is subsequent to it. So we actually, combination of factors, we were late to starting this series. The episode Through episode six is already out. Um, we're not going to get that far in this recording or even this weekend. Mm. But yeah, so I just rec- I finished it just last week. Okay. Uh, or two weeks ago. But then with other conflicts and travel, we're just now getting around to starting the series. I quite enjoyed the book. I thought it was, for the most part, a very fair examination of the subject, the case, mm. and the things that he talks about. And I liked his approach to it. Mm. Yeah, I'm quite impressed by the book. I'm curious to see where this where the series yeah. goes. The only thing I'm going to clarify is this is not based on the novel by John Krakauer. It's not a novel. It's a, or sorry, yeah, based on the book by John Krakauer, if I can say his name right, but is inspired by the John Krakauer book. Okay. So that's a distinction to make because it's not using that as as it's using it as somewhat source material, yeah. but then it's taking its liberties from that. Mm. And Dustin Lance Black has written, uh, he's most known for writing the screenplay to Melk, but he's written on the church a lot before. He grew up in it. He was the principal writer on the show Big Love, which is about a polygamous family uh, in Utah, modern day polygamous family. He has something of an axe to grind. I'm going to say that right off. He's, he, he's homosexual. He has been involved in a film called Eight, the Mormon Proposition, about Proposition Eight. So he, he's got some issues with the church. So that, right off, that's there. But that doesn't mean it's not good trauma and that he doesn't have something to say, that he doesn't have some points, and and I think he does, and of course we'll get into that. As far as the book goes, I first audio booked it back right around the time it came out in like 2003, 2004, and I've listened to it several times over the years. I I think it's a really interesting book. Again, it wasn't particularly well received within the church because it was highlighting some things that... I mean, there. Anytime you want to examine a history, there's always things that aren't great. I thought he was fairly fair to the church. The, the biggest criticism you can make in jo- of John Krakauer in the book is his view of religion in general yeah. and Christianity. Nothing specific to yeah. the LDS faith. And Krakauer has uh, identified himself as basically an agnostic. Mm-hmm. It's important to remember that the book came out in the years immediately after 9/11, and that. A lot of anti-religious feeling was brought up by 9-11 for, for obvious reasons. And so this was something in something of the heat of the moment afterwards. So I don't know if him or some of the other authors uh, that were writing on were like, like Sam Harris, for example. I think some of the things that he said in his early work, which were pretty extreme against Islam, I'm not sure he would uh, say things quite the same way now. Yeah. But that definitely Well, the other thing that's this. interesting about that is that John Krakauer states in the book that this is not the book that he set out to write. Mm-hmm. But just as he continued to do the research for the book, this is where he ended up. Because it is an interesting combination of things because it is a true crime story. But that true crime, 
true crime story is kind Nestled of the, the spine. It. Yeah. And then it's also kind of a social historical examination of, of uh, Mormonism. In the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints today, there's been a move away, as there has been periodically over time, from the term Mormonism. But I, I will be using it largely because it refers to a number of groups, uh, which this series is going to deal with, that all date back to Joseph Smith and the Book of Mormon. It's also more recognizable, and it's not nine words long. So it's easier to say. <laughs> but yeah, I liked the book. Uh, again, I'm a little rusty on it. I'm sure you'll be able to, to fill in certain things. Do you recall how you rated the book? I don't. I think probably four or five on the Yeah, I know Goodreads. on the Goodreads scale, the, that five-star scale, I gave it four out of five. Mm-hmm. I was quite impressed with it. I was enthralled by it. Mm-hmm. You know, it was it was one that held your attention quite easily. Yeah. So, yeah. Do you want to give us a little rundown of the story of this pilot episode? Or, or we should... We can talk briefly about the cast. It Andrew Garfield plays uh, Detective... Jeb, Jeb Pyre. Uh, Sam Worthington plays Ron Lafferty. Daisy Edgar Jones plays Brenda Lafferty. Wyatt Russell is Dan Lafferty. Gil Birmingham is Bill Taba. The Indian uh, police detective who's... Native American, yeah. yeah. Taylor St. Pierre is Jacob Lafferty. Denise Gao is Diana Lafferty. Billy Howell is Alan Lafferty, who is prominent here in this first episode. Chloe Peary is Matilda Lafferty. Seth Numrich is Robin Lafferty. Adelaide Clemens is Rebecca Pyre. Rory Culkin is Samuel Lafferty. Christopher Hired Dahl is Ammon Lafferty. Megan Leitrich is Doreen Lafferty. Rohan Mead is Morris. Britt Irvin is Sarah Laff- Lafferty. Andrew Burnap plays Joseph Smith. And Tyner Rushing is Emma Smith. It's going to be, it's a large cast. You know, there's a large, large amount of characters in this, partly because it has to do with a very large uh, LDS family. And partially because it's going to be skipping around in time more with historical figures as a yeah. series. And one thing we should get out of the way is while the actual murders and a lot of the things in the case took place in Provo, Utah, and surrounding areas there in Utah County, Utah County in the state of Utah, uh, this is set in a fictional... They give the name of the town, but I didn't quite catch it. It was East Somethingville. It's like East Worthington or something. Yeah. The location of this in the series is a fictional city. Mm. It, it was actually filmed up in Canada. Uh, it, it seems like they're going to be playing loose with location yeah. information, which I'm curious to see how that ends up playing out. And I probably will end up making references back to some of the locations mm. that you and I have visited together for other purposes, mm. but the places that I know you'll end up being familiar with. Mm. Yeah, I, my impression was this was a little south of Provo. This was in that area. I can't remember the exact town, but it's in that general area, which is a distinction that the average viewer isn't going to care about. Yeah. It'll become critical in the the social context of how a town like Provo operated. Provo, Utah is a very heavily LDS town. Uh, It is the location of Brigham Young University. And this was right in the heart of Provo that this occurred. Okay. And Provo is so dominated by the church and the university that even through the 1990s, you could not obtain a caffeinated soda in convenience stores that were near the campus. Mm. So it's just very, at this time in the 80s, this would have even been more religiously dominated. So, And one of the things that this is going to be an issue in, in this series, and it reminded me of a half-remembered quote from a man named... Wallace Steiger, who was a largely Utah-based writer, and he, he was talking about fiction in this case, but he talked about the, the, the big problem with writing fiction about the Mormons, you have to stop so often to explain things because there's just so much inside baseball. And so there's some of that here, and I'm sure it'll there's some things they kind of hint at that, that they may go on into later, but one of the things he seems to do is he writes a little more formally for some of these uh, Mormon characters in kind of a more thee and thou-ish, some kind of weird... The, the language, as I've been reading, you know, feedback on, on this online, uh, some people have taken an issue with with the 
the way some of these characters speak. But there were characters that spoke that way, and it would have been more common back in 1984 when this is set. And I did want to talk briefly before we kind of do a summary of the plot of the first episode about that opening sequence on Pioneer Day, 1984. Detective Pyrie is in his front yard working on his uh, lawnmower, playing with his two daughters. And th that is the world of my earliest memories because I lived, we both lived in Utah in the early 80s. But that idea of being outside in the grass with a parent and a Sunday and, and riding around on your bike, I mean, that is very formative for me. So I did respond uh, to that. And then, of course, he gets a phone call to go into work, and that's what brings us into the, the main narrative. Yeah. This episode centers around the discovery of the two homicide victims. Brenda Lafferty and her daughter. 15-month-old daughter who both had their throats slashed. It was very vicious, brutal murder. The wife, there was a, a cord cut off of a vacuum wrapped around the wife's neck before her, her throat was slashed. And the daughter's throat was slashed so severely that it nearly Beheaded. decapitated yeah. her. Just very brutal. And they were found in their home in central Provo, Utah. But this this episode centers around the discovery of those bodies, the detectives being assigned, going to the scene, seeing things, starting to process the scene. And while they're there processing the scene, Alan Lafferty, played by Billy Howell, approaches them. They take him into custody as a suspect taken back to the st station and as they start the process of the investigation are also starting his interrogation so which he uses uh, to start kind of monologuing on, on it the starts morning. giving yeah. well it start also uses it as a cause to give back history on the family and mm -hmm. his meeting his wife yeah so that's a lot of that first episode is the yep. background to the uh, her back brenda's background from twin falls her father being a some kind of agricultural scientist and a, a bishop and she wanted to be a broadcast, broadcast journalist, journalist. Yeah. yeah, read the news. And so she left Twin Falls to go down to BYU. Before she'd even graduated high school. And this is, was more common back then, but there was a thing, a process where you, by you could just go down to BYU early and finish your high school degree and just go right into college. So she would have been around... The same thing happens in the book Educated. Oh, okay, yeah, that's true. Yeah. And then she goes down in right around 1980... And ends up meeting Alan in church. Yeah. And Alan takes her up to a family gathering where we meet the Lafferty's and get a weird vibe from them. Yep. Especially the father. Yep. Very kind of stern patriarch. And this is right as the father and mother are supposed to be being called away on an LDS mission. And a senior mission. Senior mission. And he talks about how it's not the best time being hard economic times. Which works because they work on hard economic times right at the turn of the 80s. Yeah. But they meet the various brothers. Well, that timeline is a little bit odd because they were on their mission when the murders occurred. Okay. Yeah. So, so yeah. more liberties. Yeah. But they meet the various family during the uh, interrogation. Alan talks about how one or two of his brothers seem to be rather interested in Brenda because she uh, was quite beautiful. And the actress that plays her... Uh, Daisy Edgar Jones is rather striking. I think they're using that as a mechanism to set up things that are going to come up later yeah. in the series. Yeah, I can kind of sense so, that. Yeah. Yeah. So the sequence where they have a, a neighbor that needs their help moving some land so it doesn't get uh, repossessed by the federal government for a highway project. And so they decide they're, they're having a reunion or something. That's where Alan brings Brenda to meet the family for the first time. And so they take that Saturday to help move all these rocks off the land. And they show how Brenda is a little out of sync with the Lafferty's because all the men are going through the field to pick up the extra rocks. They're doing the, the rocks, work. And the women are all around where the food and the water is. Doing the quote-unquote support. Yeah. Yeah. And she decides, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go there and help them with the rocks. And the prospective father-in-law, the Lafferty patriarch, is not very passive-aggressive, talks to his son as he's kind of dividing up what people will be doing while they're on the senior mission. And it's like, it looks like you have your hands full. Keep working on that. There's a couple of references to things that will come in more later. They talk about the one mighty and strong, uh, a little bit about the first vision. We see some Joseph Smith translating and a few other early church history moments and flashback. Uh, they make reference to the mountain meadows, which will definitely come back into this. 
Yeah. There is a line where Alan Alan had had left the church sometime before this, or that's how he describes himself as having left. And he kind of goes on this monologue about uh, problems in church history and secrets in church history. And he says that this faith, our faith, breeds dangerous men. I don't know if breeds was the word that I meant to write down, but that it, that it, uh, dangerous men come from the faith, which is one of the controversial things about this, this idea that it's painting Mormonism as a particularly violent faith which I'm not convinced that it's particularly violent. There's always been violent acts carried out in the name of Christianity by various sects. Mm-hmm. Or in all history. religious groups. Yeah. yeah. But are you going to say that the, L- the LDS faith breeds more of yeah. that than anyone else? Yeah. you can. Different people will come to different conclusions, but... I think, I mean, it's also, by comparison, relatively young faith. So. Yeah. And then in the context in which the church was, uh, you know, moved more or less progressively westward for its first number of decades before ending up in Utah. So it was always kind of a frontier. Faith and frontiers tend to be violent, and they encountered a lot of opposition uh, from those around them. So that, I think, really needs to be taken into account. They weren't, you know, just you know, out in the suburbs being a-holes for no apparent reason. I mean, there, there's a historical context for, for a lot yeah. of the violence in, in early church history. So the episode more or less ends when they're looking for the various Lafferty siblings. They find, which one do they find running outside the hotel? Oh, it was Robin. Oh. Robin Lafferty, played by Seth Numerich. Okay. So his, so after they brought... Alan. Alan in. He said, you know, if somebody's after my family, I need to go out and find my brothers and sisters. And so they, there's this kind of a funny scene where uh, Detective Pyrie calls his wife and says, do we have an old war directory? Because we used to be in war with them. Maybe we can get their numbers. Uh, well, they're looking for previous addresses. Previous addresses. Addresses to go and look for them. <coughs> because Alan says, you know, my brother's moved recently. Yeah. I don't have the address. But they they find the current home of at least one of them, and it's obvious that people have left in a hurry. And eventually, they track them down to this hotel, and Robin Robin runs away to the back, and so the cops go and get him. And the Indian detective, Native American, Native American detective, Bill Taba, played by Gil Birmingham. Okay, so he knows from a conversation earlier with uh, Jeb Pyrie that they had been in a ward together, and he says, you know, these people know you. They may know where your wife and kids are. I'll handle this from here. Go home to your to your wife. So he goes home. He has a little conversation with his mother, who's in dementia, who lives with them, and then uh, a little scene with the wife, and that's more or less uh, where things end on this episode. It's intriguing. I'm intrigued. Yeah. Um, the reviews I've heard of this thus far have said it takes a couple episodes to, to get, get going, going, but that once you get further into the series, you have more appreciation for the early episodes. So, mm. not horribly impressed yet, but yeah. that's common with a pilot. Mm. My only critique of this episode so far, can you guess what okay. it is? It's going to be some inside baseball, something about a location, some minor point. Nope. No. It's that closing scene with the wife. Interesting artistic choice to end uh. with unnecessary nudity as yeah. she climbs into the shower with him mm. that could have been done without showing yeah. things and been just as effective so interesting artistic choice there my only criticism of the series so far okay. so okay. yeah well we'll be back in the near term yep. with more under the banner of heaven and i'm rob i'm nate and this is rob and nate record a podcast and it's dark for four o'clock it's because of the clouds the storms Do you want me to pull up a, the episode or just the series uh, just in the general? Cast. Okay, you ready? All right, it's recording. All right. I like that the recording's my job and you worry about it more than I do. Yes, indeed. Only sometimes, though. Mm. Yeah. You ready? I'm going to go. Introduction to my introduction? Croc Hour. Hold on, it's I can find it, actually. I, I've seen it a couple times. Or I thought I could.
um yeah it's it, it the yeah. i think i think uh, i also noticed the depiction of garments yeah i saw period that too. garments so yeah I, I didn't really have a problem with that because it's it's period mm. they weren't doing it egregiously uh, yeah. or um mean-spiritedly mm. 